So, having finished my 1840s evening dress, with a week to spare before the ball in Bath, I had the possibly worst idea I've ever had to try and make a late 1830s day dress in a week as somebody with an energy limiting condition and numerous other commitments. Should we see if I make it? <laughs> so if I have any hope in hell of making this happen, I need to make this as straightforward on myself as possible. So I'm going to use the pattern that I used to make this dress with a few minor changes to make it late 1830s as opposed to early 1840s. And the reason I'm doing that is because the fit is more forgiving. You don't, it doesn't extend below the waist, so you don't have to worry about it fitting over the skirts. It just stops dead. Also, the decoration, like doing, setting these pleats took me like three hours. I'm not doing that again. So I've actually been looking at an example in Nora War, which is my favourite of the costume history books I have. And I think I'm going for this design on page... Oh, it doesn't have page numbers. Diagram 62, if you have this book. This one. And I'm doing that one because actually the decoration is really simple and the pattern manipulation is really straightforward as well. So to get from here to that design won't be too much work in theory. I have some fabric which I bought online and it was one of those things I sort of fell in love with the print. It's pink with little green circles and darker pink dashes. Uh, I thought it was sort of just right for this era but it's not a quilt cotton weight. However when it turned up I hadn't realised it's only 90 centimetres wide so I probably won't have enough. So at midnight last night, I sort of panicked about the fact that I was actually going to attempt this project and I ordered two more metres of this fabric to hopefully have enough. It is very lightweight, as you can see, and that means it's a little sheer. So it means I'm going to have to back it with something. I went into my local quilt shop to buy four metres of plain white cotton, which cost me a staggering £36. And I'm a little bit like <gasps> at the thought of paying £9 a metre for plain white cotton that's only 115 centimetres wide. But I guess because it's quilt cotton, it's uh, whatever, OTEC certified and all that sort of thing. So I'm sort of trying to be like, let myself off for the expense of plain white cotton. I can't believe it. Why don't I just cut up some bed sheets? Anyway, however, like I say, that is 115 centimetres wide and my skirt panels are only going to be 90 centimetres wide. So I was originally going to flat line them, base them together sort of thing, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that because the seams are going to be a nightmare. So I think I'm basically going to, well, first of all, I have to pre-wash it. I haven't pre-washed it yet, but I think I'm going to sort of make a drop in lining and then hem them and pleat them together at the top, which means it probably won't behave exactly how I want it to. I might have to hem them separately. Oh well. So some shortcuts I've already planned on this is I'm going to do a machine blind hem because it, will, it really will not show on the print like this. That will make this whole process a lot quicker. I also am not going to cartridge pleat the back like I did on this one because that's a whole bunch of hand sewing that I don't have time for. I'm just going to do pleats in the front and then just ordinary gathers at the back and that seems to be perfectly accurate for the late 1830s. What I do have to do is spend some time transforming the pattern that fits me that I made for this because I'll be wearing all the same undergarments into an 1830s pattern and it's probably going to be some basic dart manipulation but also the issue is going to be the shoulder placement because this sits really very off the shoulder and so I need to raise that up and also the shape of the armhole is do I have the pattern pieces the shape of the armhole is very 1840s it's got a right angle in it and um and you can see it really tilts away and has almost another right angle there. And I don't want that for the 1830s. So I think I'm probably going to go back to my version one of this pattern with the mock-up because that had higher armholes, but sort of use the lower fit, half fit of the torso. This is why you always should keep your version one pattern pieces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the armhole from the first version, but the bottom half from the second version. Apart from, I'm just gonna straighten it out at the waistline. Looks like the sleeve I can use the same, the top half of the sleeve anyway, and then I just have to draft a pattern piece Ugh! for the lower sleeve, which is the big poofy section. So wish me luck. Time to start on this pattern. 
The pattern alterations for this dress were really quite simple. As I'd kept every version of the patterns I'd made for my 1840s bodice, I could just go back to the version that was closest to what I needed now and work from there. Plus, the pattern itself only had the one dart in the front. All other shaping was done at the side seams. As I was still making quite a few alterations to this version of the pattern, I knew I would need another mock-up. I used a scrap of a bedsheet left over from all the other mock-ups I made and pinned the pattern pieces in place, adding the seam allowance with my Pattern Master ruler. I could then cut the pieces out and I transferred the markings for the darts using a tracing wheel. Sewing the toile together was thankfully very quick. I used a long stitch length which helped, but I did my usual order of operations, starting with the darts. I also made the decision to tack in all my sewing lines to make them easier to see when I do the fitting, but I didn't have time for hand basting so I did it on the sewing machine. It uses more thread, but it's so much quicker. In this case, it would also act as stay stitching. The bodice pieces are cut on the bias, meaning the side seams are cut on an angle. This means they are prone to stretching out and warping, which can mean you don't get an accurate idea of the fit. The stitching should help to prevent any drastic stretching or warping. After this, it was shoulder seams. I then tacked in the sewing lines on the armholes too. I wasn't going to do a sleeve mock-up just yet, I wanted to make sure the armhole was looking right before that, so I needed to see where the sewing line actually was. And then on this style of dress there is a centre front seam, so I stitched up the centre back because it's much easier to pin together the centre front on yourself than it is the centre back, before joining the side seams. You can see there is a chunk missing from the bottom corner of the seam allowance here. That's just because I was working with scrap fabric and it wasn't quite wide enough. And then I did the other side seam and we had a mock-up. All right, team, we'll have to put up with the non-aesthetic side of the garage, but I don't have space. So let me talk you through the alterations. This is the mock-up. I think it's pretty good. This is the side I've done the alteration to. As you can probably see, because you can see my chemise, it's too low in the front. I thought it would be. And even two centimetres seam allowance is not enough. So already it's coming unpinned. So this pin here is sort of in line where with where I think it should uh, end so um, that way it will definitely cover my chemise. I also think this dart is unnecessary lo ne unnecessarily long so I'm just going to sh um, shrink it down a bit. I'm losing hardly any fabric in there anyway so a bit more bust room. Oh well. The back is also too low and uh, as I've cut into it into the hollow of my shoulder blades it's gaping. This shoulder seam you can see here I've just changed the angle of the shoulder seam on the back piece and that should hopefully shrink in that gape there. It's a trade-off. I can't shape the centre back seam. Can't really put a dart in it. So once I've got a bone in there, it will just gape away from my body. Actually, I think this one says it has a cord, but I'm going to use a bone. Anyway, so not too many alterations. I think this as a lining is going to be perfectly acceptable. It was worth doing this. Yeah, all in all, I don't think that's too bad going. I will have to cut another round of fabric for the lining, but oh well. I also have to create the pleated outer fabric pieces. I also haven't done a sleeve mock-up. I mean the armhole I think looks pretty good so the sleeve, I've measured the sleeve and it should fit. I think I'm gonna wing that one but yeah the pleated main fabric pieces now I know this fits I can um, I can make those. I'm still a little bit concerned about I've got a bit of a sort of 1840s armhole shape here. I don't know whether I want to move that. It's quite, it does hollow in quite a bit. Maybe I'll scooch that out just a touch. Oh, but then on the, hmm, hmm. Do you know what? I'm going to leave it. It's fine. Okay, I'm taking all this shit off because it's hurting me today. I did decide I needed a sleeve mock-up. I didn't want to risk it not fitting and I was really worried about the armhole the more I looked at it. So I thought it's better to be safe than sorry. And I threw in a very bitty sleeve mock-up. Oh, hey, I'm hardly in the shot. But what I really wanted to show you, I'm not putting the corset on, is the sleeve mock-up. I think to piece it together to get a sleeve out but I actually think it's too big for the armhole I've got too much ease because can you see how it sort of is bubbling a bit there it's not that's the sort of amount of ease you would want when the sleeve is up there to get over the roll of the shoulder but I don't need it to get over the roll of the shoulder I need it to lie flat over my arm I quite like the sort of width of it though 
I suppose it could come in just a touch. Um, so I think I'm just going to shrink this. I'm going to measure how long it is and then I'm going to take my tape measure and sort of redraw the top of this curve and um, see what my new line is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So it currently measures 44 and I think I need it to measure more like 43. So if I sort of get the tape measure to do that. I used to have one of those like flexi curve things but it broke is not great is it so I think it'll be more like that Does that take us to about 43 yeah it's so about there and then I reckon if we just like round this out a bit something like that it's a bit longer than 43 oh well that'll do Just ease that in a bit nicer. Ta-da! Sleeve version 2. And so what else am I working with? Oh yes, I'll need to adjust that one to match. But also, I see here I've measured in off my pins. That's how much I want to do is out of there. So we're just going to do that. This is where I want my dart apex to be. So I'm just going to redraw those like that. And then what I want is a bit of tape on a bit of paper. Probably best to do it like that. Come on, tape. Oh, look, I was looking for those and they were in there all along. Much better. Smashing. Right, so what I'm going to do now is create the main fabric layer with a bit of basic sort of dart manipulation. I'm going to turn these two pattern pieces into these two pattern pieces so they should match up exactly and they just have the excess in the shoulder seam and centre front. Um, there was a tape measure somewhere here. Is it around my neck? No. Oh, it's on the floor. Oh my god, the chaos of my mind. So, what I wanted to do was see, because obviously it's it's got quite, if you look at sort of the diagram here, there's more pleats at the centre front than there is at the shoulder. Okay, so I'm going to start by tracing the back. Oh, and I wanted to raise this back neckline as well actually, didn't I? At least two centimetres. Right, so hold what we're doing. <laughs> so, roughly how much are we working with here? So each pleat is about an inch. I need my other pattern cutting, but I can't remember how to do this from memory. Will this be in the back? Yeah. I think I know what I'm doing now. Once I'd refreshed my memory, I drew a series of curved lines from shoulder seam to centre back. I spaced the lines closer together at the shoulder and further apart at the centre back. I then cut out the pattern piece so that I could do a slash and spread, slashing along those curved lines to add the volume I wanted and then taping a new bit of paper behind to fill in the gaps. I used the Nora War pattern as a guide for how far apart to space my bits of paper to get the right amount of volume. Only, of course, my pattern is not the exact same size and shape of the pattern which was taken off of an original, much smaller dress. I just tried to keep the proportions about the same so that it would look close enough. Once I had all that extra volume added, I needed to true up the seams. I did this by folding out all that excess I'd just added and pinning the paper in place, putting the original lining piece on top of it, drawing around it and then trimming all that excess paper off. Looking back on the footage from this, I really struggled with it and that's because I'd forgotten that the centre back has no darts. 
Usually you use the dark fullness to create volume, but I couldn't do that for the back, so things just felt really off. When I came to the front, I finally realized what was going wrong with the back, and the front piece went much more smoothly. You can see I've moved the dart to the center front seam, opening up the volume where I want to put my pleats. Much easier. With the pattern pieces complete, I could start cutting my fabric. I tore off the panels I would need to make the skirt, so I knew just how much fabric I had left for the bodice. I also tore off what I would need for the skirt lining, at least what I thought I might need. I still wasn't sure what I was going to do about the skirt lining. Then I could start cutting the fabric. I recruited my glamorous assistant to help with this. Not only was it a time thing, but as you know, cutting is hard for me because of my energy limiting condition. We used the dining table because it's bigger and easier to sit at. I instructed my assistant how to pin things on the straight of grain or on the bias, and then drew on all the seam allowances. I then gave very clear instructions about cutting on the chalk line, not around the paper piece. An easy mistake to make even for more experienced makers. I was very grateful for the assistance, not only for the sake of my back and knees, but it was a classic case of many hands make light work. It did take a while to prep everything, pin it out, chalk it up, etc. But a lot of that I could do sat down and then the actual cutting was done in a few minutes. We had prepped the lining pieces at the same time as the main, so we could just move on to those straight away. And the more complicated pieces that had to match up or that I had forgotten when making the paper pattern, like the cuffs, I tackled while mum made sterling work of the bodice pieces. Obviously, it helps if you can find a glamorous assistant with some experience of dressmaking, but careful supervision and guidance makes all the difference. Now here you'll see me doing two marking up methods I never normally use. Firstly, I marked the darts on the lining fabric using tailor's tacks. In this case, the darts are very straightforward to sew and there's only two of them. So it was just the quickest way to transfer the information from the pattern. For my other markings, I used pencil. Now I usually use chalk or carbon transfer paper, but I did a test and the marks from the colored chalk and the carbon paper were very visible because my main fabric is so sheer and light in color. So the pencil is less noticeable because it just looks like a shadow. You might also have noticed I have only one centimeter of seam allowance on this dress. I never worked with such small seam allowances, but I was so short on fabric, I had to make some sacrifices. Before making up the bodice, each layer of fabric got a good press, and then I could start mounting the gathered fabric pieces onto the smaller lining pieces. At first, I fussed around a lot with the tape measure, trying to get them to not only be even, but to match the ones on the original Nora War dress. But I soon gave up on that. I often have to remind myself that trying to perfectly recreate the past is futile. It's never going to be accurate to an original for a multitude of reasons outside of my control. What I actually want is for it to look good and be easy to sew. <laughs> I imagine in a way that's actually the highest form of accuracy because the original dress was either made by a home seamstress with a million and one other things to worry about, or it was made in a sweatshop by mistreated workers, either of whom were probably not worrying about the perfect proportions of their pleats. In the end, I went for what looks good and trusted my instincts. Looking back at this, I wish I had added more volume in the back. I didn't do a great job of the pattern cutting and it looks a bit lackluster as a result. But then I remember I was really tight on fabric, so maybe I couldn't have added more volume. For the front, I changed tact and decided to sew some hand gathering threads in the front section to help manage the volume. The one concession to precision I made was to try and match the pleats over the shoulder seam. That's the thing with these slightly off the shoulder gowns, the shoulder seam becomes very prominent, so I took the time to try and get it to match. Now you might have spotted my mistake before I did here. I was going to all the effort of pleating the outer fabric onto the lining, but I hadn't sewn the darts in the front pieces yet. No wonder I was struggling. <laughs> so I had to carefully unpin everything and sew up the darts. Again, here I'm doing something I don't usually do and reversing at the tip of my darts. I do it very carefully to prevent a pucker, but I was making this dress with the intention of being able to machine wash it, so I chose this option as it's stronger than tying the threads together. And it's going to be covered with fabric, so if it looks a bit bulky at the end, it's not going to be seen anyway. With the darts sewn, I removed my tailor's tack, which was a bit tricky, so I was glad I'd used this not too noticeable light blue thread, and then I could press the darts towards the center front. 
I could then return to mounting the main fabric on the lining and organising all those pleats at the centre front. With the gathers, I still wanted them to line nicely, so I couldn't help but fuss about with them for ages before pinning them in place. And I also tried to get the two halves of the centre front to match across the seam like I had done for the shoulders before I had to redo it. <laughs> I could then start working on the little sleeve puff decorations. I had to piece the fabric together to get enough width to gather down, but as we know, piecing is period. I then penciled on some lines according to the diagram in Nora War to gather down the fabric and then sewed long gathering stitches along those lines using my sewing machine. The time for hand gathering was long past. <laughs> While I was at it, I also gathered the top and bottom edge of the lower sleeve pieces. Then using a similar method to the way I'd mounted the pleats on the bodice, I pulled up the gathering threads, pleated the edges, and stitched the puffs in position onto the lining fabric. I also attached the top half of the sleeve main fabric to the puffy section before mounting it onto the lining so I could hide that seam a bit better. I then used the overlocker to actually sew all the main pieces to the lining pieces. With hindsight, I wish I had tacked over the pleated sections on the sewing machine first because the overlocker definitely pushed the pleats and gathers around, undoing a lot of my hard work spent fussing with them to get them just right. But I was going for speed at this point, so I guess I didn't have time for that. I also overlocked the raw edges of the pieces that weren't lined, like the lower sleeves. I was using the selvages for my skirt panels, so I didn't need to overlock those, thankfully. I could then make up the sleeves. I matched both ends of the lower sleeve to the bottom of the decorative ruffled section and then pulled on the gathering threads to shrink it down to be the right size. I didn't start the gathers right at the seam to allow for a flat section at the underarm. I then smoothed the gathers as best I could and pinned them in place. I then went into task batching mode, pinning as many things together as I could before getting my sewing machine back out. You might have noticed I skipped drawing on my sewing lines. As I was using such a narrow seam allowance and such a light coloured fabric, I decided to skip it. There wasn't a suitable way to mark it up that wouldn't show on the finished garment and I didn't have time to go through and remove lots of markings. I did use a tracing wheel to make some pinprick marks on some seams, but they haven't shown up on camera. With everything pinned, I could machine everything together. I took my time over the pleated and gathered sections. My experience with the overlocker had taught me to be careful, and as I was also now sewing from the wrong side, I couldn't see if I was catching anything I shouldn't. The sleeves were particularly tricky to do. With hindsight, I should have used a narrower foot like a zipper foot because the bulk of the poof decoration made it really hard to get this under the sewing machine and I was sewing gathers to gathers. It was a tricky one. Then it was time to crack out the iron and give everything a good press. Much like the 1840s bodice, most of the seams were curved, so I relied heavily on my tailor's ham. But some of the seams were flat, so I could use my wool pressing mat, and boy, if I thought sewing that sleeve seam was tricky, I was not prepared to try and iron it. I had to get a bit creative with the edge of the iron to avoid crushing the puffs. The only part of the sleeves I was yet to work on was the cuffs. I cut some fusible interfacing for the main fabric and used my iron to press it in place. I'm really pressing here, as in actually pressing down on the iron with a lot of pressure to really get the glue to fuse to the fabric. It was also at this point that I realised I was going to need some piping. I cut the very little scrap fabric I had left into bias strips using my scissors. I said it in the last video and I'll say it again. I can't use a rotary cutter because they're not safe for me to use because of my disability. So please don't comment to tell me to use one. And once again, right on cue, my hand stops working and I flick something across the sewing machine. And that's why I don't feel safe using a rotary cutter. <laughs> Here, I'm joining the lining fabric to the main fabric of the cuffs that I just interfaced. I'm seaming up the cuffs in one with the sleeve, so I'm only joining it on one edge. I then make my piping by wrapping the bias strips I'd cut around a 3mm piping cord and sewing it tightly, but not too tightly, in place using a zipper foot. With the piping made up, I pinned it along the sewing line around the neck and began machining it in place again with the zipper foot. I sewed just inside my previous row of stitching, making the cord even snugger in the casing, but also hiding any visible stitching from the right side. The point of the V-neckline was a bit tricky, but I had deliberately not sewn the seam closed past the beginning of the seam allowance when joining the centre fronts. 
This then acted like a snip into the seam so that I could pivot the fabric around to sew it in smoothly without any puckers. With the last few bits of sewing done in that batch, I got the iron out to start pressing. First the cuffs and then the piping around to the inside of the neckline. I soon gave up trying to do it on the flat table and dug out my tailor's hand once again, making it much easier. So I've had a funny sort of few days with this. I think the last thing you saw me do was on Thursday and then I powered through all Friday so that I could take the weekend off. And I've kind of gotten back at it this, uh, this afternoon. I had some other sort of work things to do in the morning and I realized I hadn't filmed anything. So I thought I'd give you an update. So the sleeves are now made up and on. I absolutely love them. I made the sleeves up flat and then when I came to join them, none of this lined up, despite the fact that I traced an identical curve for the underarm seam. I had to pleat one half of it, <laughs> it didn't fit. And it's just one of those things, I've just gone with it. Because this is a much lower stakes kind of garment than the ball gown, I'm rushing through it, I know it, that means I do have to compromise on quality. I have still however managed to herringbone down the piping and the sleeves are now in. They went in surprisingly well, I'm very happy with how that went. Tacked them in first, which always makes a difference. What I need to do now is I need to make up the skirt make up a waistband and because these are dresses they're not a separate bodice and a skirt I have to attach it all together. However I have this dilemma because this pink fabric is only 90 centimeters wide and the white cotton I've been using as my flat lining is 115. So I don't know how I'm going to flat line it. I need to think about that one and it's quarter to five and it's not a great time to start thinking out puzzles like that. So I was going to just attach the waistband to the bodice, ready to go. And I realised I've only got really scrappy bits of this pink left. And I have ordered two more metres of it, which is supposed to come in the post today, and it hasn't. Um, so part of me is like, should I just piece together scraps and make a waistband? Would that really annoy me? Or shall I just wait for the fabric to arrive? But I'm really running out of tasks I can do because I don't want to bone the bodice until I've attached the skirt because that will make sewing on the waistband or at least attach the waistband because that will make it really difficult and I might hit the bones. Tricky, I'm kind of stuck. Oh, I, the other thing I wanted to mention was I didn't end up piping the armhole because I don't have any piping cord left. So I just left it. Like I say, I'm doing a lot of compromising on this project. What I might do is I might just run the pink skirt panels together so that they're all joined together and then I know how much of the white cotton I need to cut off from one panel, then that's at least something. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. Nice easy task to finish the day. As the pink cotton was so narrow, I used minimal seam allowances and just matched the selvages up as I went on the panels I had torn up earlier. Using the selvage means I don't have to do an edge finish and I skipped the pins because it's just a straight seam and I needed to save time. I did the same thing with the white quilt cotton panels before I had an important realisation. So I've been joining together the panels on my white cotton. However, because this is quilt cotton, it's very stiff. It's also very heavy. It's very densely woven and sort of solid. And um, I need to cut down as much weight as possible if I'm going to have any chance of surviving this weekend. It's just too heavy. I'll faint with the weight of it all. So this is three 45 inch wide panels and it's heavier than that mid 19th century petticoat I made to go under the ball dress, which is two lots of 90 inch wide lawn. <laughs> I can't use this. I bought this fabric and now I can't use it. So I've done a bit of research and I've looked at some examples I've been able to find online. And there are examples of skirts that are both lined and completely unlined. It also says in the workwoman's guides that skirts in this era are usually lined with cotton. So I don't think it will be the end of the world if I don't line the skirt. But that does leave me a dilemma about the petticoats I wear. Because I have that massive one, which is basically going to be twice the circumference of the circumference of the dress. And I'm not sure how that will look. I have the organdy one, which is slimmer, but not very dense. Do I need another petticoat? I think let's make up the skirt. Oh yeah, my fabric that was supposed to arrive yesterday still isn't here, despite coming by FedEx. So I have two days before I leave for bath. I think I'm just gonna have to make up the skirt, 
even if I just sort of baste it onto a length of cotton tape temporarily or something and try it on with various petticoats to see how it looks and how I feel. Great. I actually decided I should probably finish the bodice first before I even worried about my flat lining petticoat dilemma. So I added the bone to the centre back. Yes, the original said it had a cord, but I'd run out of piping cord, but I did have some spiral steel left. I had made a facing piece for the centre back edge, so there is a seam along the edge of the bone, but I still wanted to have a lot of fabric in there for alterations. I had used the selvage for the edge of the facing, so I didn't have to finish anything, and then I just herring boned it down to the lining. I made the decision to piece the waistband instead of wasting time waiting for my fabric to arrive. I tried to get the seams to line up with the side seams so that it wasn't as obvious it had been pieced together. I cut a strip of fusible interfacing for the waistband and then ironed it on over the seams so it hopefully would reinforce those areas. And then I pleated down the front of the skirt and tacked those pleats in place on the machine. A bit like with the ball gown, I was quite free with my pleats. So long as they looked okay from the front, I was fine with them being a bit wonky on the back. I also wasn't adding a pocket to this dress to save time, so that made the pleats easier. I still went very slowly, smoothing everything in place so I didn't catch anything I wasn't supposed to. For the back half of the skirt, I ran two lines of machine basting along the top to gather that section down. I didn't have time for hand gathering or cartridge pleating, so machine gathers it was, and I was running them through the machine so fast, I wobbled the camera out of position. I then attached the waistband to the bodice, and then carefully machined the pleated and gathered down skirt to the bottom half of the waistband. I had decided at this point that I just wasn't going to bother with a lining. I had less than two days to try and get this dress done, and I thought I'd rather have a slightly droopy skirt to wear than nothing at all. I then had to level the hem. As I had torn the fabric into panels, they were all over the place, and so I drew in the hemline I wanted before trimming everything down to do a narrow rolled hem. I briefly entertained the idea of facing the skirt with organdy, but I couldn't get it to work, so I had to abandon that plan. I cut the hem down to about an inch, this was because that's the maximum I could get away with on my shortest panel, turned under the raw edge about half a centimetre using my iron, and then folded up the hem to the right length. I basted all the way around the hem on the sewing machine because I knew I wanted to do a machine blind hem. A machine blind hem requires a special foot, and you have to do a lot of tinkering with your machine settings to set it up to get it to look right, but when it works, it's an incredibly quick way to hem a skirt like this, and you have an almost invisible finish. You can't get it quite as invisible as if you did it by hand, but it's certainly good enough for me. With the skirt hemmed, I was onto the last few finishing touches. I needed a facing for the waistband to enclose all those raw edges. I used white cotton for this to match the lining of the bodice. I stitched the facing to the seam allowance of the bodice and waistband seam and then pressed it down over the seam allowances of the waistband, turning up the raw edge and pinning it in place from the right side to hide the seam with the skirt. I also pressed the hem of the skirt while I had the iron out. I had pinned the waistband facing in place from the right side because I knew I wanted to do a sink stitch or a stitch in the ditch to secure it in place. Wrestling the boned bodice of the dress through the sewing machine was tricky, but I do still think it was quicker than hand sewing it at this point. I did hand sew the ends of the waistband in place. I had deliberately left them longer to fold back over the white facings so that I would have a little bit of extra fabric should I need to let the dress out and to make sure none of the white showed from the outside. But with that, we were finally onto the hooks and bars, the last step. As you can see, I was expertly filming this final step of the process. This was two days before I left for Bath, but with the fastenings on, the dress was done. I'd made it, with a day to spare. I didn't end up wearing this outfit for very long in Bath, but I am glad I made it. Unlike the ball gown that turned out just as I wanted, this one... I'll save you all my nitpicking, but really it comes down to the fact I don't love the colour on me. But I actually had a lot of fun making this, despite the tight deadline, and so I can still look on it fondly. As I finished with a day to spare, I even had time to make myself some accessories to match. Mostly, I'm just really proud of myself. 
I did it. I got to go to the ball. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>